Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. What do razor blades and fish hooks have in common? Well, sometimes a razor blade can feel sharp, but it won't cut all the whiskers off your face. Usually the hooks in your tackle box will feel sharp to your finger, but they're not going to be sharp enough to hook every fish that bites. We're going to talk about that. We're going to go fishing on the St. Clair River, have a great recipe and a lot more, so stay tuned. We're going to be back with sharpening hooks in just a moment. You know one thing, about this lure that is different here. Just put your hand up here. Ho, you, huh? Ho, ho. It's sticking me there. For I it. know. That is, isn't that about the sharpest hooks you've ever Those felt? Nice. Yeah. Mark, how do you do it? How do you sharpen them like this? He has a... You've got a diamond hone here. You want to touch them about two to three times. The man honing this hook by hand is Captain Mark Martin who says sharp hooks helped nearly 75 of his customers last year land Stroh's Award walleye. Losing less fish with sharp hooks is something that caused Bing McClellan from Traverse City to come up with an automated sharpener. Probably takes an average fisherman maybe 30 seconds, a minute maybe, to sharpen a hook. One point. One point on one hook, which mm -hmm. might take you know, five minutes to sharpen all the hooks here. And, of course, they can easily get damaged on rocks, right. snags. Absolutely. You came up with an invention how to sharpen all these in 30 seconds. Well, it's a, it's a very simple tool. It's called a hook honer. And that's indeed exactly what it is. It hones the hooks rather than, than grinds metal off as, as hones or sharpeners or files type wood. Is this because you, of course, you spend so darn much time fishing? Mm -hmm. And you know sharp hooks are really the key to catching a lot of fish. Well, that's right. That's one of the few things, aside from motherhood, you can't argue about. <laughs> that's right. This little gizmo, interesting, you have the prototype yep. here. Yep. This, it was developed, what, a year ago? 1987, January 14th was the first time I saw it. Uh, I had commissioned a guy about a year earlier to try to mechanically give me a perfect hook point, mm -hmm. one that is lapped and polished instead of sharpened with a file. You know, the funny thing that, that fishermen don't realize, or anglers, that when you have light line, like two pound test line that I've been fishing with today, yeah. the strength of that knot is probably closer to one pound mm -hmm. than two pounds. So when yeah. you go to set the hook on a fish, you're pulling actually with less than one pound right. of force. Right. And and even if you're using six pound test, you're probably pulling mm -hmm. most you can get out of is two pounds of force. Yeah. Now, how often, though, should you really sharpen your hook? Say you catch a fish on it, well, or you get snagged. Would you, would you sharpen it every time? No. Good heavens, no. How often? I'd just do the thumbnail test every so often during the day I'm oh. fishing, and if it if it skids on my thumbnail, I touch it up. Now, okay, show me that dude uh, right. on your thumbnail. Okay. How you're gonna? Well, a properly sharpened point. Let me get this thing tuned up here. How hard are you pushing down? Oh, not hard at all. You're just holding it in place. There's no... See? That's right. Just There's take, no secret to it, eh? Take a minute here. Let's look at this prototype and see what happens inside this. This baby rotates around and buzzes. Yeah, it's lapping the hook point back and forth 300 times a second while it rotates around the hook point three times a second. So put the hook point there where it would be okay, well, if we were sharpening this. All right. And it goes around yeah. like that. It, rota it orbits the hook point. So now you have it sharpened. Now how do you know when it's the way you want it? Well, take your th fingernail or thumbnail, and if you can do that and it doesn't skid off, just barely yep. touch your hook, uh, hook point to your nail, and if it'll stick, it's sharp enough. Stick right there, whoa wee. Yeah, now try one of the other hooks that hasn't been sharpened. Okay, and you can tell by looking at them yeah, that they right. don't have, if they've been sharpened, they're real s silver. Look at that, I can't even get that factory point. Right, right. Well, well that's, that's kind of. That's a brand new Rapala right out of the box. I, I cannot dig that into my fingernail. Mm -hmm. I can scratch with it, and it feels sharp, yeah. And it hurts. And it looks sharp. And it looks sharp, but it doesn't do what this one does, catching on the fingernail. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that. That's why people will buy it, because you can demonstrate oh, the yeah. fact that they'll be more successful. Well, you could have it fun makes common just, sense. just tearing your finger up here, seeing how sharp <laughs> that is. Look at my thumbnail from all the shows I did. I almost punctured it. I look at that. Really, out. You have to push real hard to, to get your skin to come up. Oh, you could dig out, you could <laughs> dig out splinters with this. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna... I think it has a good future. Oh. It really does. If it can improve my fishing. 
There you go. It has a big future in my life, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. Our mutual friend, Emil Dean, ran him some tests on us on a, with a prototype last year. And if there's anything harder to do is because sharp hooks make more importance in downrigger fishing than anything. Oh, yeah, because you're trolling. Because you can't set the hook. Yeah, the fish has to set, set it. Set it for you. Yeah. Yeah. And his hook catch versus line pop-off percentage went up 50% after he sharpened all the hooks. 50%? That makes it 50. You know, I believe it. Uh, when I sharpened just the hook on this lure, mm -hmm. caught two fish in a row, bang, bang. You know, they weren't slipping. Yeah. I think that that does. If it can stick to your stick to your skin, stick to your fingernail, mm -hmm. it's got to stick that much more inside a fish's mouth. Well, it's a very convenient little machine because it's NICAD powered. You recharge from the rear here in the little port. Recharger comes with it. Um, runs about a thousand hook points to charge, so it isn't going to quit on you quick. Once you get out in the boat, you can sharpen mm -hmm. literally a thousand hooks before you have to to take her back in and plug her in overnight. You've been you've been to the big fishing tackle trade shows for years. Mm -hmm. I get mail. I get people sending me inventions. Some of the goofiest things you've ever seen, mm -hmm. and they're similar in a way to hey, here's the idea that can. You know, yeah, revolutionize right. your fishing. That's the same thing you say about this. Yes. I have yeah. a feeling, though, this is going to stick. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> a pretty good pun besides being yeah, correct. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> that's right. I think so because it's so basic. In fishing, there's only one thing that is totally, two things that are totally common, water and sharp hooks. Mm -hmm. Because a fisherman literally cannot fish without a hook. He cannot. He can fish fly fishing. He can fish spin casting. He can fish salt water. But he got to have a hook. He's got to have water. How, how did you? Bing McClellan certainly boiled fishing down to the basics. It doesn't matter if you use a battery-powered hook honer or if you use a diamond file to sharpen the points on your fish hooks. Your success will increase if the points are sharp like a surgeon's needle. Mark Martin's success rate proved it, and when Emil Dean started using the battery-powered honer to keep the treble hook sharp on his lures, Emil's loss of fish because of hooking failures dropped in half. A significant lesson to all anglers in Michigan outdoors. You'll want to sharpen your hooks if you're a Great Lakes angler. It's starting to heat up. In the southwest, we have steelhead and lakers in 65 to 85 feet of water. Off Manistee, Pentwater, they're getting uh, 8 to 12 per trip, 15 to 20 pound kings. Uh, it's a little slower up in the northern part of the state, but around the corner at Rogers City, limits of both kings and lake trout. Steve Pazlaski says lake trout fishing has never been better off Oscoda. They're getting limits of 12 pounders jigging and on off the downriggers. Now, looking at our report on the other species, uh, as many catfish as you want to catch off Oscoda, including a couple of walleye at the mouth there, but the walleye are really hot in Saginaw Bay, Charity Islands. They're getting limit catches. Catfish, three to seven pounds, wild fowl bay. Some walleye limits down here in Lake Erie. Six to seven miles out, though, is the big news. 14 to 16 inch perch. Speaking of perch, off the Captain Nichols at South Haven, 600 perch were caught by 30 anglers the other day. We've got limits of bluegill and Houghton Lake, 8 to 10 inches up in Manuskong Bay. Panfish, smallmouth bass, pike are all being caught. The walleye have moved into deeper water, getting a few herring. Limit catches of bass, pike, and perch in Bay to Knock. The perch, by the way, 10 to 14 inches out in 20 to 25 feet of water. Uh, we're getting some limits of largemouth bass up in the Houghton area and a few walleye and bass on Lake Gogibic. They did have a cold front move through there. The trout, the problem is, where are the streams? Not enough water, low oxygen levels, but rusty gates at Ah Sable says, uh, 18 to 9 inch, 19 inch browns at night, slate winged olives and white winged blacks are the hatches. So there is some good fishing, but watch that fire danger, it's still a problem. <laughs> Montcalm County produced this trophy largemouth bass, six pounds, four ounces, caught in Clifford Lake on a plastic worm by Jeremy Keplinger from Birch Run. Also on a plastic worm from the Grand River, Jeff Barnes, who was probably bass fishing, landed this one pound, two ounce bluegill. Jeff's from Kentwood. Here's a long, lanky walleye, weighed 10 pounds even, taken on a night crawler from the Sheboygan River by hometowner Mike Rogers from Sheboygan. You don't often see lake trout this size, 21 pounds, 37 inches long. It came from Lake Superior off the UP's Alger County. Mike Lindquist from Autrain caught it, trolling a dodger and fly, a favorite lake trout rig. 
One of the larger gobblers you'll find, 21 pounder with a nine and a quarter inch beard, Chris Fink from Powamo bagged it in farm country in Osceola County. Look at the long 11 inch tines on this buck's rack. That's an 11 point to boot. Taken in Genesee County, that buck weighed nearly 200 pounds. Lots of venison, a Stroh's hunting award for Jack Helvelman from Linden, who's in the spotlight as our Michigan Outdoors Big Buck Hunter of the Week. The drought news continues to be bad, especially for southern Michigan fish. Low water levels and high temperatures are beginning to take a toll. Ducks and woodcock are hurting, but black bears may be in severe trouble with few berries around to fatten them up for their winter sleep. And there's a change in the bear season this year in parts of Delta, Dickinson, and Menominee counties. The shortened season will run from September 10th through the 30th in order to reduce the harvest in that area. State police advise that anyone owning a shotgun with a pistol grip that's less than 30 inches in overall length must register it. The gun that's most frequently affected is the Mossberg 500. The governor is expected to sign into law a bill to set perch limits of 100 in the eastern part of the lower peninsula and 50 perch elsewhere in the state. Currently, only the upper peninsula has a limit on perch. Applications for this fall's turkey season in the Upper Peninsula are out and available at DNR offices. Application deadline is August 1st. Some local governments have seen another way to nickel and dime sportsmen. They're now charging for the permits to purchase and register handguns. In Macomb County, the fees are $5 for the purchase permit and $5 to register a handgun. Now, this fee isn't likely to break anyone, but it is part of a trend that scares me. Cities like Detroit and some metropolitan cities are now charging for the permits, and there's no cap on how much they can charge. Because the fees aren't regulated by any legislative statute, and a gun councilmen or commissioners could raise the fees to a couple of hundred bucks and effectively keep anyone from buying a handgun. Now, State Representative Bill Brown has asked the Attorney General to issue an opinion as to the legality of the service fees. It's a good bet they're not even legal, but that ruling could take several years unless the legislature asks the Attorney General to get on the stick and issue his opinion right away. Because until he does, handgun owners are walking a short plank at the mercy of some anti-gun local governments. A DNR hunting regulation says that bow hunting from permanent tree stands is illegal. Tree stands must be portable. And Gordon Phillips from Springport comments, In my opinion, none of them have been safe. At 49, the last thing I need is to fall out of a tree. On your program, you showed a stand in a clump of birches in a beautiful setting. Are these permanent stands illegal? Well, this permanent tree stand was built by Avery Sterling on his property at Lost Arrow Lodge. And according to DNR Law Division Chief Herb Burns, the DNR will not write tickets for nailing a tree stand to a tree on private property. Public land? Yes, it would be illegal. Summer walleye like the night. That's when they come into the shallows to feed, but summertime also has its share of thunderstorms. Lightning warmed the sky to the north as we casted twister tail jigs from a dock on the St. Clair River. One old salt who was fishing with us was Captain Hank Bradley, retired muskie captain. I asked him why the fishing was starting off so slow. So what's the scoop tonight? The scoop tonight is... <laughs> hey, you now, hold it. You've been, on, you've been fishing this river and this lake for umpteen years. Okay, let's see that beautiful lightning over there. Uh -huh. I've seen it like that, the moon. Uh, it seems uh, <laughs> a night's like this, too beautiful a night. We should, should be, be out here getting wet. We should be out here you think it's the, you dodging think it's, waves. Well, the moon is full. The moon's full. The walleyes are laying down the bottom, peaceful and quiet. I guess we got to suffer to get a lot of walleyes, right? <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, how come you're out here if, if you think that it's too beautiful of a night? It's so nice for a night. What are you going to do? <laughs> Stay home and go Stay sleep? Home, that's right. Go to a beer garden. It's better to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Evening casting is relaxing even when the fishing is slow. Now a rock bass gave us some momentary excitement, but it was those walleye we were after. Well, maybe it was the full moon or the wind or the storms to the north. Well, we had just packed up our cameras to move to what we hoped was a better spot when one of the fellows brought in a nice-sized walleye. 
Well, he jumped a couple of times when you guys were walking up there, and I figured I'd, I'm going to try this. Yeah. That's about the only There we go. There's a nice well, fish. Well, that's a nice heck fish. of a fish. You got to run and hold it up there. You got that in a bottle. Smile. You yeah. smile? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you smile. Yeah. Only walleye of the evening we got here. So what was the secret? Patience, my friend, patience. The St. Clair River and patience. It's the only secret there is. Well, since that was the only walleye taken from that dock, our patience had worn thin, so we moved downstream to another backyard. Now, keep yeah, in mind that fishing from shore on the St. Clair River is often done on private property. You need permission to fish from backyards and docks. There are a few public sites, but if you're not familiar with the area, do a little homework in advance, make some arrangements. Tom DeHardy and Frank Riscavage fish the St. Clair River all the time. Their favorite lures at this time of year are twister tails on jigs. When Ken Ouellette from Lansing landed the first keeper walleye on this location, a big flurry followed, changing twister tails to match the one that Ken had been using. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Nice yeah, you're a good start on walleye fishing for Kinoulet under the full moon on the St. Clair River. We fished till 3 a.m., got a few, enough for a good meal. This is what walleye fishing is all about. <laughs> yeah, that's the best part of it right here is uh, getting them ready for the freezer and then uh, cooking them up for, for supper. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the rewards. Hardly any better tasting fish than a walleye. You agree, Tom? Oh, definitely. I'll tell you. Is that why you like fishing for walleye? Uh, the action. I like the action. It's fast, you know, casting and that, and I can't prove it by tonight, but we do, you do real good on the walleyes and that, and the eating. I, you can't, there's not a better fish for eating. I like smallmouth bass, too, though, but I think I prefer the walleye over all of them. Well, here in the St. Clair River, you catch all kinds of fish. Well, as you see tonight, we've got a little variety, silver bass, smallmouth bass, rock bass, and caught us a little off guard. We weren't really prepared for it, but yeah, there is a big variety. Everything from pike, uh, musky fishing up by Fawn Island. Uh, uh, just, yeah, there is, overall, it's a big variety of fish. We took a variety of fish on this evening. Here, Frank Riscavage swinging a white bass onto shore. We took a rock bass, a smallmouth bass. No big walleye, though, like Tom DeHardy caught earlier that week. It was an eight pounder, caught the same way we were fishing. Casting, I was fishing that tournament, and we were up above. We were up above the Blue Water Bridge. We did real good as far as catching fish. We were nailing right and left, but no big ones. You know, I figured mm -hmm. this many people, I said, I got to find a nice secluded spot where there's going to be a nice hog walleye. So I took a gamble and went down to Marysville where nobody was fishing, fished out of my boat, and I think I made maybe a half a dozen casts. Now, when you fish out of your boat, don't a lot of the boat fishermen in the summer fish right near the shore? Right, definitely. So you, what's what the you, advantage what you of the boat? Do, what you want to do in this river, you've got a structure break where it comes up into the shallows, like we're casting here. When we cast out, we're going out over that structure break, drops off into from, oh, I'd say anywhere from 12 feet of water on out 18 feet, then it drops on off into 25, 30 feet of water. The walleyes will hug that structure. They'll lay in there. It's the same thing when we anchor and we fish in the spring. We try to try to hug that structure line. That's what mainly is, because that's where the fish will come in. They'll move up that shelf. As it starts to get dark, they'll come into 25 feet of water. As it gets darker, then they'll move right on up into the shallows. So this, this casting from shore is only good at night? Definitely, only at night. For no. walleye, that is. Strictly for walleye. Well, this yeah. summer, night fishing is a good way to beat the heat in Michigan outdoors. The rough grouse exhibits two color phases, gray and red. What's the benefit of this to the grouse? It's camouflage. More red phase grouse are found in hardwood forest where their coloring more closely matches the dead leaves of the forest floor. More gray phase grouse are found in the shadowy evergreen forest. As far as presentation goes, this recipe, Kathy, is tops. It looks gorgeous. Oh, does. You almost hate to cut into it. This is called salmon spinach mold with white sauce, a recipe that Diane Lardy from Diamonddale entered into our Fish and Wild Game cooking contest last March. As the runner-up. This is so beautiful, I can't even bear to cut into it quite yet <laughs> with the spoon. But she got a score of 36, mm -hmm. and the winning fish recipe was a 37. So close. Very close. Before we cut into this, let's see how we put it together. It was really quite easy. I was kind of surprised. Got spinach that's been parboiled, and you're going to chop it. 
cooked for about five minutes right. or so? Right, like I said, it's not cooked completely through. And we've got butter here. You could use margarine, but I think I prefer butter, the taste of butter. And fry the scallions in it and just kind of cook them through just until they're soft, not complete, completely done. And a spinach. You're going to fry the spinach with hmm. your scallions. Fried which is spinach. Different. Doesn't sound real appetizing right here. But oh, it, it's, a, it's an odd combination. Looks like it would go into stuffed shells or something. Mm-hmm. Okay, you got salt and pepper, just a little bit. So uh, there's Greek recipes of spinach, to right. some type of spinach And pie. Parmesan cheese, which it would oh. also be a Greek. Now you're going to use a whole cup here, and it really disappears quite fast. It gets creamy. Your Parmesan cheese will get creamy in here. When you were putting this together, we were taping this. Mm -hmm. You were eating right out of this dish right here, Kat. <laughs> and it was good, believe it me. It was just a good spinach recipe on its own. That's right. This salmon, you cut thinner than the normal fillet. These so were very it, thick fillets. Well, there's a big salmon we catch. <laughs> That's uh, right. I must have those. <laughs> yeah, Bob. <laughs> Go line your dish here. Now you got a grease casserole dish. You can actually just kind of line your dish with the fillets. And salt and pepper a little bit more. Now you wouldn't really need to salt and pepper here if you didn't want to, and especially with the salt. But Diane said salt and pepper. That's she, right. She got the, the runner-up status with this. And some paprika. Paprika, that's a kind of pepper, isn't it? It is. Pepper, it's just exactly what it is. And lemon juice. Now, you always find lemon juice with a fish dish because it enhances it, so it just kind of brings out that flavor in fish. It also takes uh, some of the stronger flavor, if it, it has does. any stronger right. flavor. Now, you're going to pour your spinach mixture right in the middle of this. Hmm. And just kind of make a... Because your fish makes down. a little nest. Yep. Yeah. Just Now, you want to cook this in water. Put your whole dish in water because you don't want the bottom to brown because you do want to get it out of there easily. Well, that's right, because we flipped it upside down here. Mm -hmm. Huh, and then this is the white, white sauce. White sauce, butter and flour. Now, you want to make a thick white sauce because you don't want it to run all off your mold. And milk. And with white sauce, you have to cook it slowly. That's, it'll keep it from lumping up. Mm -hmm. And just until it thickens up. And you're supposed to put a little teeny bit of the broth from the casserole. Yes, and some scallions. Pour, flip this thing upside down and it holds together even it when sure it's did. hot? Yep. And there's the white sauce, and I guess it's time to cut into it. Does this break your heart, Bob, to cut into this and put it on your plate? It looks much better with several pieces missing out of it. <laughs> okay, well, here's a good-sized chunk for you, Bob, and there's the... You can see we'll the see spinach, spinach in yeah. there. Hmm. Interesting. Now, the comments, as Bob is tasting it once again to refresh his memory, I'll say that in our Fish and Wild Game cookbook, Bob said that this was a... You've never had a combination like this before. Can't mm. say that now because you've eaten one before, but this is no strong taste of salmon. Chef Randy Bell said that he wasn't a fish lover, but he said the, pres the presentation of this is beautiful and the combination is great. And it certainly is a beautiful dish. There's the spinach inside with the cheese. How is it, Bob? Oh, it's, it's great. But, you know, I liked it a lot. But Mort Neff, he gave it a perfect 10. I'll tell he you, did he a was perfect absolutely. 10. He says, Mort says this is a championship dish. Who's going to quarrel with Mort? You know? That's right. <laughs> Okay, after you saw it, you wished you wrote down the ingredients to tonight's recipe. Well, you're in luck. They're printed in a handy clip-out format in the July-August issue of the Outdoor Digest. And if you're not a subscriber, we'll send you this issue free of charge, which also contains hunting and fishing articles, including one by archery expert Al Henderson on the basics of making a good shot. The Outdoors Forever Supplement has a half dozen heart-healthy fish recipes for the summer, and the Digest also has rundowns on each week's programs, including our featured TV recipes. To get your free copy, along with information on joining the club and becoming a subscriber, write to me at Fred Trost Outdoors Club, P.O. Box 1775, East Lansing, Michigan, 48826. We'll send you the July-August issue right away. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll sharpen our hooks for some of those tasty South Haven perch, our annual perch fishing trip with the Captain Nichols, an award-winning recipe for venison baked chops, an update on fishing conditions, and a lot more. So join us, same time, same station. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan